Welcome to this video lecture. My name is Mark Scythian. The date today is December 15th, 2022. This lecture will focus on Whistler wave phase and group velocities. This is part of electromagnetics and optics physics material. So you may have seen a problem similar to the wave function W of K function where the speed of light C squared times the absolute value of WC sub E divided into actually the frequency, the omega symbol look, looks like W, but it's omega sub CE. And that is divided into omega squared sub PE times the wave function squared K squared times cosine. And this describes the dispersion velocity involved in the phase in group wave functions. And then you were also given a B sub O component aligned with the Z, which is actually aligned with the Z axis as the depth function. So that is a formality to get a reference of what the expression is representing. And so we can focus on the X, Y plane, the wave function. So this is where we have to begin. And so sometimes a problem like this will throw students off and it kind of is like overwhelming, but you can't look at the components per se as one should look at the entire expression as just simply dispersion velocity. So in starting the problem solving with this particular type of problem is by means of substituting the components in a relationship that either is algebraic or with calculus rates of change. So you'll see that something like this, when the refractive index is no longer having a rate of change, the disbursement velocity then describes an equalization of phase and group velocities equal to the speed of light. So it's actually a very easy problem to solve, but the details behind what every component represents should be looked at as individual components. So, uh, for example, here, move down a little bit and here. So you're asked to calculate a, the phase velocity V sub P and the group velocity V sub G as a Whistler wave function. So the relationship between the phase velocity and the group velocity is represented by the speed of light squared, which is actually the phase velocity times the group velocity. So these formulations could be looked up and then you find a relationship that's actually easier, easy to work with. So next we have the ratio between the speed of light C and V sub P, which is in equality to the refractive index. The end value, which is the speed of light divided into the phase velocity, which is equal to the speed of light times the wave function divided into the frequency. So this is actually too many words to describe something very simple. So you have a group velocity, which is equal to the phase velocity only when the refractive index is a constant or the derivative of the refractive index n with respect to the derivative of the wave function has no rate of change. So it's not fluctuating. So it's rate of change is zero. So once that is established, then the refractive index is a constant. And then you just have the relationship between the V sub P and V sub G. So to illustrate better onto that principle, we have then the disperse, uh, dispersion velocity again, that 
then we have the refractive index is equal to CK divided into omega or the frequency. So we could actually assign the disbursement velocity, the W sub K function as U, and then we can assign CK as V. So we just have U and V to deal with. And so W sub K is the frequency of some function, W sub K of the wave number K. So that's just a function. So therefore the N refractive index is simply the ratio of v, v over U, which is all of that detailed components above placed into a simple ratio. So if we elaborate further, the speed of light squared is the product of the phase velocity times the group velocity. Therefore, the phase velocity is equal to the speed of light squared divided into the group velocity. So this is how we can simply define or redefine the phase velocity by algebraic rearrangement. And again, we can do the same to the group velocity. So that means when we solve for one or the other, we can place the component we're looking for or components we're looking for into a rearrangement. So all of this details are simply just the component itself, the W sub K. And so again, we just rearrange this algebraically. And so the answer to A and B would actually be a formula because individual components can be entered after the testing or the experimental phase collects data. So you're actually entering a formulation or a formula as the correct submitted answers for A and B. So when we rearrange all these around, if you work with these and get some experience on algebraic rearrangements and substitution, we see that the uh, part A and part B are the formulations, which then describe the phase and group velocities accordingly. So if we move on to another common supplementary question that is accompanied, the Whistler wave function is some function tangent theta is equal to sine theta times cosine theta divided into the quantity of one plus cosine squared theta. Now, the waveform that they're going to ask to accompany questions part A and B at the last part of a question like this uh, throws a lot of details again, but you're simply looking for the inverse tangent to go find the waveform. You're actually trying to solve for the angle in this case, and it may be either the alpha or the theta symbol. So if they give either or, you may want to just stick with the theta symbol or the angle. So you just find the inverse tangent of that expression. And it's actually a really easy question, but the details tend to throw many students off on the uh, problem solving strategy. So you can go ahead and use the inverse tangent of some tangent angle as specified here and then use the TI-84 graphing calculator or a graphing calculator that uh, capable of just general trig trigonometric graphing functions. So TI-84 is good. And then there's the GeoGebra online app at geogebra.org, which is a really nice graphing universal calculator with a has everything on it. You can graph, you can do equations. And uh, so go ahead and put the inverse tangent of that function, sine theta times cosine theta divided into the quantity of one plus cosine squared theta. Go ahead and put that one in and make sure you set the, uh, the mode to radian mode, actually, to do, to do these types of uh, problems. It, it seems counterintuitive to use uh, radian mode versus the degree mode because trig functions are generally in the degree mode, but we're actually trying to graph the wave angle, 
but then its visual or its graphic rendering is going to be with respect to the radiance. So put it into radian mode and then go ahead and uh, find, okay, so to graph the inverse tangent function and then to find the angle which maximizes phi, that would be the radian equivalent to that degrees with respect to the amplitude. So you then have a function established with respect to the x-axis. Uh, go ahead and find the angle which maximizes phi, which is the theta value in radian mode. A max, then a max value of phi would be the amplitude. And then sketch the meaning of phi max, which is probably in your question. And so from that point on, you can enter into graphing calculators at the radian mode in this format here. So tan inverse tangent and then double parenthesis and then sine x, open parenthesis x times cosine x, double just like this. And then you put that represents this here because there's really specific formats how it's entered in the calculator, the graphing calculator, and then let graph then uh, let graph then select zoom and zoom fit. So on T on the TI 84, uh, that's uh, zoom fit. It's like zero, I think on the list for uh, zoom or uh, zoom fit it's zero. And I think uh, six is the standard fit. So you can go to zero on it on a selection mode. And then after that, the graph will come out looking really even and clear instead of all over the place or underrepresented. And so you'll get a amplitude plus or minus 0.3398. And you can use it over the X limits of negative 10 to positive 10, because that technically should go on from the X limits of the uh, domain, the X axis of negative to positive infinity. So you can just use plus or minus X plus or minus 10 on the X axis. But what you're looking for is that constant amplitude. So if they ask you to sketch a graph, it should be something like this. And then if you need to figure out exact frequencies, you can multiply the lambda, the wavelength times the speed of light, or you have the speed of light, you have the lambda times the frequency, and you can graph that on the time stamp or the time constant on the x-axis for whatever time limit you're dealing with. It becomes really easy to find that. And then you multiply it, you get then the frequency times the wavelength. Now you have the crest, trough, crest, trough, you know, you have the crest to crest or trough to trough uh, distances for the wavelength. And then you have the cycles per second, you have the phase shift, and you can actually find phase angle, you can find frequency, and all of these then, you know, really easily you can get the wavelength times the frequency to compute the speed of the wave, but it should be at C it should be at speed of light. So uh, getting the amplitude is the primary point of calculating everything else. So uh, that's pretty much going to be your answer. And that's what the instructors are looking for, for submission, because then after that, it's really easy to work with to figure anything else out. That's all about algebraic uh, sums and summations. So that is the recommendations to solve this problem or problem set in the Whistler wave function. And that concludes this lecture. So I will go back up here. And as a reminder of the problem set, you'll have something like this. And this is probably really familiar to some problems that are found in most textbooks is the disbursement dispersion velocity. And this is pertinent to the Whistler wave phase and group velocities. So thank you for watching this lecture and have a great day.